So I'm delighted to be here introducing um, our first keynote of ASL 2016. Alison McCrina's work really embodies the spirit of this year's conference theme. RIA in August last year and she gave up time during her holiday in Dublin. At that talk she demonstrated how information professionals are on the front lines of the fight for digital privacy and, and can act as a powerful force for education on digital privacy issues. Uh, Alison's former IT librarian for the Watertown Free Public Library in Massachusetts and member of Boston's Radical Reference Collective. In 2014, following the Civil Organization, she founded the Library Freedom Project on the premise that intellectual freedom depends on the right to privacy. The Library Freedom Project aims to protect the principles of intellectual freedom in libraries by teaching librarians about privacy rights and providing training on privacy protecting technology to safeguard digital freedom. Last year, the Library Freedom Project was awarded a funding grant from the Knight Foundation to develop and expand on their work. This has taken the Library Freedom Project to a global audience and allowed Alison to deliver talks across the US and beyond. Alison was named one of the Library Journal's 2015 Movers and Shakers for her pioneering work on privacy protection in libraries. And if this hasn't been enough, if this hasn't been impressive enough, uh, her work on the tour exit relays has managed to make a fanboy of Edward Snow himself, <laughs> making her officially a car carrying badass. <laughs> So please give a big ASL welcome to Alison. Dublin, you are about to be with Rina. I have no idea how I'm going to follow that poem though, you guys. I mean, that was, that was amazing. Um, I don't know what I'm doing here, so please help me with... I don't understand technology at all, actually. That whole IT library thing, I was faking my way through. Let's see. Excellent. Okay, fantastic. Hi, everybody. I'm so happy to be back in Dublin. Um, I had a great time. I met a number of you in August um, when I gave a brief talk back then, and I'm just so honored that you chose to have me be your keynote and start off this conference um, of such an important topic, which is smashing stereotypes, which we all hate. Um, so, a little bit about me and what I do. So, my name is Allison. Obviously, I run Library Freedom Project. The mission of Library Freedom Project is to make real the promise of intellectual freedom in libraries. And the reason that I identified that as our mission is because we now know that we are living in a world of pervasive surveillance um, from many different directions. It's not really the sort of 1984 Big Brother model. It's not even uh, the Bentham Panopticon. Um, it's a number of different things. Quite often it's called a surveillance assemblage. It comes from all corners and affects our entire digital lives. Um, and so I want to talk to you this morning about why anyone should care about this, what this means for libraries, what we can do about it, and um, what happens when we take the risk of, of actually doing something. So, you guys are all wearing this lovely button that Laura made uh, of, of this guy's smiling face. Um, we learned a great number of things from this man, Edward Snowden, beginning in around June 2013. Um, what we learned from him was that the most powerful governments in the world are pretty much spying on all of us. Uh, whether we've been accused of any crime, whether we are citizens of those countries or foreign nationals, um, this is in the service of a much bigger uh, endemic problem, which is endless war, the global war on terror. And so surveillance is a kind of foot soldier of other issues that we've seen of expansive government powers and state secrecy. So what Snowden taught
So it is massive, it's pervasive, it covers metadata and content, um, it covers every single contour of your digital lives from email to web searches and the like. Um, so just to give you an idea, I think the, you know, thinking about the scale of this problem, we can You know, holding about 16 gigs or 20 or so, uh, the the NSA Utah Data Center um, can house the content of 312 billion of those. So if you have a 16 gigabyte iPhone, uh, 312 billion, every human on the planet gets as many iPhones as she can possibly carry. Um, so I think you know that sort of illustrates exactly the scale of this. If you think about it in terms of other surveillance societies that we have known, if you take, for example, the uh, East German secret police, the, the Stasi, and you take a look at the uh, amazing archive that ha has been amassed um, in post-Soviet Berlin, if you go to this archive and take a look at the, all the information that the Stasi uh, collected on their own citizens, this archive is about, it's like two German city blocks, about four stories high. If you were to map that out in, in terms of what the Utah Data Center can hold, uh, a four-story building holding the same amount would cover all of North America, extend into both the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans, and, and go down further a little bit into South America. So we're talking about the most information, the greatest surveillance society that the world has ever seen, in part because the closing decades of the 21st century have, have ushered in the ability to do this. So collecting and storing information is very cheap, it's very easy to do, and because these, com these governments have so much money to do it, um, what they are able to do is endless. So, you know, thinking about the American model, I think, you know, I want to make sure that everyone understands just exactly what this means for you as uh, Irish, as people who are citizens of the world, who think that, you know, perhaps this is a problem not just for my country, but for many. Um, one of the issues of the surveillance society is that it is predicated on a massive amount of information sharing. So the NSA is sort of, you know, like I said, they're the nerve center, but what they do with that information, they share it with foreign governments, they rely on the capabilities of other uh, uh, surveillance mechanisms and use it to spy on people all over. So I love this little, you know, GCHQ graffiti, um, but what this actually amounts to for you is that there is strong evidence that GCHQ has access to all the cables in Ireland. Um, sort of similar to what the NSA has done in the Bahamas, which is that there is a, a small island nation that they have the ability to, um, to you know, damage the sovereignty of by spying on them all the time. So you know, this has an effect for you here in Ireland, um, and the, the, the part of the problem with what we learned from Snowden is that we don't actually know the extent of how this information is being used. What Snowden taught us is a fraction of the, the programs that exist, and the way that they're being, uh, what, what's happening, uh, how they're being conducted, who they're used against. So we don't actually know the extent of how they affect you and I. Um, so lest you think, though, that this issue is one of just you know rogue government intelligence agencies with too much money and too much power, it is the private sector as well. So everyone in here can probably think of like five Google services that they use. Just count them up in your head right now. Gmail, Google Maps, you know, if you have an Android phone, Google Scholar, who knows what else. Um, Google is the most powerful advertising company in the world. They have a revenue, uh, annual revenue right now of about $520 billion. They were just neck and neck with Apple recently. And 90% of that revenue comes directly from advertising. So the reason why they're able to provide all of these services to you is because you are the product. Now, this is not simply a problem for um, what are, what kind of 
of relationship we have to these services and what they want to show us in order for us to better consume, in order for them to better sell us products. Part of the problem is that they are actively sharing this information with all of those intelligence agencies. So I mentioned a program like XKeyscore, for example. Part of what XKeyscore is able to query is advertising and analytics traffic from the major service providers of the world. And I'm scapegoating Google, but Google is nowhere near the extent of the problem. I mean, Facebook has its own $300 billion year revenue, and most of it is from advertising. Um, so, you know, these private companies are actively creating some effectively personal dossiers of each of us, using it to sell us products and also sharing it with intelligence agencies. And I think, you know, part of the issue for, for us, those of us who care about intellectual freedom, is that this is not just a surveillance matter, it's a matter of censorship. So they are shaping the internet that we see because they want to better sell us products. So, the problem with a lot of this is that they keep telling us that this is for our own good, right? That this is a matter of national security, that this information needs to be kept. Um, the, the problem with that is that they, they continue to do this without evidence. So in my country, for example, um, we had a d domestic terrorist attack where I lived in Boston two years ago. Um, Boston had been a, a incredibly surveilled. We had CCTV, we had... Um, uh, uh, fusion center type operations that were sharing information between local law enforcement and government intelligence. And the two people responsible for that terrorist attack were under active surveillance for, the, for a few years by the FBI and the CIA because of their relationship to Russia. And that didn't do anything to stop it. But of course, right after it happened, the first thing that local and national governments did in my country was call for more surveillance. So they continue to, to push this line about national security. And the other problem about the national security line is that that is a great excuse for them to act in even greater secrecy. So, you know, it's, it is uh, sort of concentric circles around the U.S. extending out to the rest of the world, um, continuing to privatize and commodify our data and then use it against us. So why does any of this matter for us as library and information professionals? Well, one thing that I think is really remarkable about this profession, and I've been thinking a lot about this in the sort of smashing stereotypes thing, because I think that we are unfairly stereotyped as not caring about these things, when actually it's a very conservative and traditional view of librarianship to think about privacy and intellectual freedom. So, you know, I don't know where we sort of lost that public opinion along the way, but I think we can do a lot to get it back. We have cared more about privacy than I think any other professional group. Um, in the US, we fought back against things like the USA Patriot Act and against other surveillance authorizations much louder than anyone else did, certainly. I mean, we even made t-shirts. Um, we recognize in librarianship that privacy and intellectual freedom are very inextricably linked. The idea that if you have, if you are, don't actually have privacy, you can't actually have intellectual freedom. If you believe you're being watched, you can't read, write, research, and think freely. So we see the relationship of these things, and also the relationship that this has to censorship. Um, the other reason why I think that we are the ones who care about this is that we can see very easily the relationship that these issues have to our local communities. So, you know, for example, people who are Muslim are much more affected by the surveillance state than people who are not. And if we work in libraries, we interact with our communities every day, we see the real material effect on them. Um, you know, another example would be um, LGBT persons are much more affected by surveillance. Um, people who live in poverty, people who are homeless or have experienced homelessness or have been in prison. And we know this, we have this relationship already with many different kinds of people just by virtue of the fact of the work that we do. The other part of this is that if we don't work on this issue, no one else is going to do it. So, ooh, that didn't render very well. Imagine if there were words on this slide that said, what can we do? I'm so sorry, I don't know why that happened here. Can you see it? It's very faint. Yeah. Oh, okay, good. Well, I can't see it, so I'll have to take your word for it. Um, so, the problem of all of this is very massive, absolutely. But I, I want you to be reassured by the fact that there are very specific and discreet things that can be done you can do today, and that it's, if you start doing them today, you know, it's sort of a, a, a process that you can continue, especially with the support of your colleagues and organizations. So there are meaningful actions that you can take, and I'm gonna tell you about them. 
So the first thing I think, uh, the most important thing is to know your rights. Uh, part of the issue of surveillance is that it is a violation of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and many of our local constitutions. Um, Article 19 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights uh, codifies the right to privacy of all citizens of the world. Um, the problem is that people don't often pay attention to these documents, and so part of knowing your rights, not just simply understanding that you have a right to privacy and that you are not a criminal if you want, a right to, if you want your right to privacy, but participating in and supporting the work of organizations that are fighting for this every day. So a few international organizations, Privacy International and Article 19, uh, they work on impact litigation and policy. They are actively fighting over broad surveillance authorizations all over the world and bringing these issues to the fore in the public imagination. Locally, Digital Rights Ireland, they are small, but they are powerful. Um, if you are not familiar with the work of Digital Rights Ireland already, I encourage you to look them up first because they are, they are uh, truly embody the Irish spirit of, of underdog radicalism because they have like three or four staff or something and they do really incredible work. Um, in addition, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, while based in the US, does have an international focus. And they are, they are suing the NSA uh, every single day. They're in courts all the time, fighting not just on behalf of people in the US, but people everywhere. And then lastly, an American organization, the ACLU, while they focus entirely on the US Constitution, they are trying to reel in, just in the same way that EFF is, reel in the surveillance powers of our uh, intelligence agencies that are affecting all of you. So know who they are, you know, understand what they're working on, and, and find ways to support them. Uh, the next step is to know and understand who your adversary is. So who, when you use the internet, think about the services that you use, and think about who might have access to all of that information, and what their, what their goal is with providing you the service. So I'm not saying that that means that you should ditch Facebook and Google immediately. I mean, if you do, that's great. But I don't think that's actually a realistic goal for most people. But understand that these are advertising companies. They are, their bottom line is to know as much information about you as possible, and they're, they are, they're not working with your best interests in mind. So be vigilant about them, and only give them exactly what you, what you really need to. Uh, in addition, it's possible to blind them on occasion, and to use services that actually do protect your freedom uh, in your digital rights. So the technology that you can, that you can trust that can help you. If you come to my workshop tomorrow, I'll teach you some of it. Um, but just to give you a broad overview, there are a number of different organizations that are working to build uh, privacy respecting, freedom enhancing technology that doesn't collect information about you, that doesn't share it with intelligence agencies, and helps you fight back against them. Um, and I've got just a few of them up here. Um, you know, Tor is freedom enhancing software that helps protect some of your privacy when you use their web browser. Um, GNU Linux uh, is operating systems that can help you be more private um, and get away from the power of Microsoft and Apple and things like that. Um, a lot of folks might be familiar with Mozilla because they make a few sort of more mainstream tools like Mozilla Firefox, um, but they make a number of other tools that do respect your freedom um, and they're actively working, pushing to make more privacy protective measures in the software that exists. Um, Generally speaking, if we use free and open source software, that is software where the source code is shared openly, where it can be examined for things like government backdoors or uh, for any kind of anything that might be hoovering up information about us, um, that software is what makes up the sort of backbone of all of these projects. Uh, in addition, if we use strong end-to-end -end encryption, we can uh, make it possible to communicate over the internet without sharing all of our information in plain text with these adversaries. Um, and then, you know, generally speaking, use things that don't collect data about us as a, as a condition of using the service. Um, in addition to using these tools, there are a number of technologists who would love to work more with libraries to help um, implement them in, on your local computers um, to help you teach privacy enhancing computer classes and just to give you some backup because this is kind of a brand new world for all of us and we can use all the help we can get. Um, there are amazing local hacker spaces here in Dublin and I have some connections to them if anybody wants to know who they are. Um, in addition, the, the, all of these projects are run mostly by volunteers all over the world 
who care a great deal about surveillance, who love librarians, because who doesn't love librarians, and want to find ways to help us implement these in our local communities as much as possible. I think, though, you know, what I've mentioned here are just a few ideas. Uh, the, the thing with a problem this massive is that we need to get creative about it. And so I want to point you to a really great quote that I love from the late Aaron Swartz, who was an internet activist um, who pushed back so hard against uh, U.S. intelligence agencies that they basically ruined his life. Um, he said, what is the most important thing I could be working on in the world right now? And if you are not working on that, why aren't you? So I want you to consider Aaron's legacy and thinking about any creative ways that you might push back against this problem. Um, the things that I've said are really just a starting point, and I know that as librarians, we are very creative people, and we can think of even more ways to make this happen. Um, I like thinking about Aaron's legacy in this space, not just because he was such a hugely important person for the internet freedom movement, but because I think he well recognized that the internet is a powerful force. It's not at all just a communications tool. It's our entire world. The line between real life and internet life is blurred all the time. I actually think that we can totally dispatch with saying IRL in real life. I think we should start saying AFK away from keyboard because there is an IRL. The internet is real life. Um, I think all the time about what the internet has taught me even. You know, I went to college and grad school and I learned a great deal there. But my education, my political education, um, everything that I think about and the things that I care about and work on now happened because of the internet. Because I had access to all of these people and different ways of thinking and experiences that were wholly unlike my own that I would have never had. So the internet, not simply a communications tool, it's a whole new world. It's so worth protecting. Aaron recognized that and also recognized that what we have currently is an internet that is controlled by competing interests. And what it should be is one that's controlled by the people. And I think that we as librarians can really usher that in. We can push back against the privatization and um, uh, uh, you know, total government control that's happening now and make it into something that's much more egalitarian. So I realize too that what I'm asking you to do is kind of a big thing. I mean, we're talking about some of the most powerful entities in the world. They have endless uh, budgets, they are really secretive, and they regularly do hurt people who try to poke them. Um, Aaron is a great example of this. He's a good person who did amazing work and he's no longer with us. Um, but I want to encourage you to be brave nonetheless, and the more of us who are brave and push back against them, the easier it will get. So just so you know that I'm not full of shit, I actually do this. Here is a picture of me after pushing back against one of my local intelligence agencies, the Department of Homeland Security. Um, if you're not familiar with them, they're a fun little Bush era um, creation. After September 11th, I stopped living in a country and started living in a homeland. Um, it's very 1930s Germany. And so DHS, what do they do? Um, they, they control the borders. They, uh, they're a counterterrorism operation. They're sort of that cartoon that I showed you earlier about the control of internet speech. It's either national security or protect the children. They do a little to protect the children, too. Um, they're not very good at any of it. And they're pretty uh, reviled in the US, but they're also quite powerful, and um, they are very scary. And so they are one of these combination intelligence agencies and law enforcement. So at one of the libraries where I, uh, I was implementing some of this privacy enhancing technology, we, we set up a Tor exit node. Um, I'll explain very briefly what that is, but if you want to know in depth, come to my workshop tomorrow. Uh, Tor, I mentioned before, is privacy enhancing technology. It can help you protect some of your personally identifiable information when you go online. And one of the ways that this works is it needs these nodes to operate, uh, basically to forward the traffic that goes through the Tor network. So it's, it's, a, it's a mechanism that helps to obscure information about the original point. Um, and they're run by volunteers all over the world. And I happen to think that these are really ideal for libraries to operate because we already provide public internet services. This is an essential piece of internet architecture. And we shouldn't have to rely on the bandwidth of, of volunteer individuals. We should be able to use our publicly funded or institutionally funded bandwidth to make this happen. 
So, we set up one of these in a library in New Hampshire, in the US, on the East Coast. And it was going really well, we got some great media attention. Because of this media attention that we got, uh, we also got the attention of DHS. And they, they contacted this library and they, they said basically, uh, this, you need to shut this operation down. Nothing had, no criminal activity had happened, of course. I mean, this is how these, these entities work. They don't actually care about fighting crime. They care about social control. So they, they contacted this library and they bullied them into shutting the relay down. Well, that wasn't okay with us. We decided to push back against them because they were, they were effectively not only criminalizing something that was not a criminal activity, but they were interfering with the autonomy of this local library and their community. So we uh, got some media interested. Uh, we wrote a letter and had it um, circulated among a number of, of different public interest groups, including the ones that I mentioned on that, on that earlier slide, Privacy International, ACLU, EFF, some of the really big players in this arena. Um, we even got the UN Special Rapporteur on Free Expression and Privacy. I'm probably forgetting some part of this title, it's quite long. Um, but a number of, of public institutions and luminary individuals from all over the world. Uh, then we circulated a petition. Um, and so as soon as the story broke, we, went, we put the petition out. Um, the story got picked up by um, American media and then international media and became this huge thing in the sort of tech, internet freedom, privacy world. And the petition got about 5,000 signatures in just a few days from all over the world. And this was all in support of, uh, of course, the library making the decision that was best for them, but telling them that if they decided to continue with this project that they had, all of these people behind them, all these people who wanted to see them continue and to succeed. So a few days later, uh, the library was having their board meeting. So we went to the board meeting with knowing that we had all of this support, and we were greeted by this, this protest outside, this pro-tour, pro-privacy, pro-library protest. And then we went inside, and you might imagine, you know, we've all worked in libraries, we know what our board meetings are generally like. Imagine what a board meeting is like in rural New Hampshire. Um, typically, you know, probably like five or six people will go, and they're all affiliated with the board in some way, and then there's like that one patron who goes to all of them. Um, well, there were about four dozen people there. They had to shut the doors um, because it was so packed. Um, and the media came, and uh, we were just incredibly floored by this. And what then happened was even more spectacular was that we heard from the community. I mean, that was really the most important thing to us, to see what, the, what people in, in that town wanted to have happen. And every single person who got up and spoke at that meeting um, not only said, this is a horrible action by DHS and we reject it entirely, but express the pride that they had in their library, how excited they were to see this happen. And I mean, at a point, there, there were stories that people shared um, where you know, everyone was a, was a little bit teary, thinking about what this action means for people. Uh, there was one woman who said that she grew up in Colombia and witnessed her country's civil war and that she wished something like Tor had existed back then because she's seen the effect that state violence can have on political distance. And she said, there would be people with us today if, some, if this technology had been present in their lives. Um, another woman who said that the idea that she, she held up, you know, her four-year-old daughter was with her and said, the idea that people on the internet want to do my daughter harm is, is horrifying to me. But I'm not, I also am horrified by the idea that she'll grow up in a world where she's, because of her safety, other people's freedoms are compromised. Um, and it was incredible. I've never, I've never seen anything like it, and I hope that that's not the last time I see something like that. Um, the point of this is that this is what happens when we can sort of dispatch with the stereotype of the quiet librarian, um, the apolitical or neutral library space. We know that these things are not true, and what we have evidence of now is that our communities will support us when we push back. Um, it's not simply, though, that we will get amazing support in our local communities. Of course, we can get pretty amazing global attention. Um, Laura pointed out the tweet that Snowden sent to me, which was like the biggest day of my life, basically. Um, but what it started with was, was this. He tweeted about librarians. And if you want a little warm fuzzy, if you want to like, you know, remember why you joined this profession, 
I encourage you to look this tweet up and look at their responses to it. Um, or look up any of the media attention that we got around this project because the refrain that I saw over and over again was people saying exactly this kind of thing. That we knew that the librarians were going to be the ones to come back against this. And that as soon as, even people who don't know that we have this professional history of resistance to uh, privacy violations and this professional commitment to privacy as one of our core values, people who didn't know that this was true immediately got it. And they were, they were like, of course, who else would this be? I mentioned before that no one else is going to do this if we don't do it. Um, I'm going to reiterate that again because I think that we have to realize what kind of, uh, what, we, what we occupy in the public imagination, that people love us so much and they want to support us. To them, we represent so many things that are valuable about their communities and about sort of democracy and all these wonderful things. Um, but the most important thing I think is that, you know, they, they can see us as a, an effective way to combat this sort of thing. Even uh, people who don't hate the spies, I think, if they see that, you know, libraries are pushing back against this and organizations, entities like DHS are then um, making our lives harder, they want to help us pursue this. So there are many different ways that we can do this. Um, we can start teaching classes in our local libraries on privacy enhancing technology. We can contact all of those entities that I mentioned before and just say, you know, I'm a librarian who cares about privacy. Can you give me some literature? Or is there any way that I can promote your work in the library? Um, many of those organizations are dying to bring their information into local communities. They will come to your library and give a lecture, um, or they will work with your staff to do a staff training around knowing your rights, understanding what to do, for example, if you get a government information request, or if you think that um, you may have been compromised in some way, or something like that. Um, you can work with some of the local hackers to throw more advanced crypto parties and things of that nature. Um, even if all you start doing today is using privacy enhancing technology yourself, you are still adding some noise, thank you. Um, you're adding some noise to the sort of, um, to the landscape. If you start making this, this change to your own behavior, you will not only protect yourself, but you will protect uh, other people who need this more because the more of us who are using encryption, the more of us who are using obfuscating tools, it, pre it presents a kind of herd immunity for anybody else who might need this. Tor is a great example of this. The more Tor connections that there are globally, the more the people who really need to use Tor um, for sort of life and death matters can be protected. It works kind of in the same way that immunization works for public health. So, all of that said, I know that this is a pretty big um, problem to, to deal with. And I want to let you know that Library Freedom Project is here to help you. Uh, we have resources on the website for teaching computer classes to your patrons. Um, we have other resources for convincing people like boards of trustees and administrations, uh, community members, even law enforcement. Because, you know, frankly, the DHS thing was the best thing that ever happened to us. Um, but it might actually go better if we convince law enforcement and local intelligence agencies that this is a good thing for us to do. It might be better for us to get their support in the first place. So we have resources to help with that. We have connections to all of those organizations that I mentioned before, to local technologists who can give you assistance. Um, we want to make you as successful at this as possible. Um, and I also want to reiterate that you have amazing local support. Um, you, you know, libraries are doing this not only in the U.S., but in the U.K., in Germany, in Mexico, um, in France. I'm leaving a few out, I'm sure. Um, but it's starting to become a global movement in Canada, Australia. I think we've got all the five eyes covered. Maybe New Zealand is the absent one, a few more NATO countries. Um, but you can participate in this global movement, and I really can't wait to see what you come up with. Um, so this is my contact information, if you want to take a picture of it. Um, I would love it if you have any questions for me now. Um, also, I hope you will come to my workshop tomorrow. <laughs> Thanks for your time. Wait until the microphone gets to you. Okay. 
Hi, Alison. My name is Thank you very much for that. That was really interesting. Oh, thank you. I admit, I am the young you at the tip of the iceberg. <laughs> that's so, okay. That's we only have a little bit of time, so. And I only know the tip of the iceberg, too, so don't feel bad. Thank you very much, and it's definitely open about taking us a screenshot, so it's okay. great to have that as I was just wondering, was there one what moment, or what was the moment, the one thing that actually you just went, hang on a minute, I've got to do something about this? I like, always went the key moment. Great question. It was the Snowden stuff, certainly. I mean, I think um, as a librarian, I was, I cared a lot about privacy, and I, and I think, you know, it's sort of in the abstract, right? But like, we think about privacy and access, and we're thinking about it, maybe, maybe not abstract, maybe more at the mundane level, right? You know, what our local policies are like, um, you know, whether we're collecting information on our patrons and all that. But when the Snowden stuff happened, I realized that all the things that, um, particularly in the U.S., that we had seen um, expanding surveillance powers and things like the USA Patriot Act, that they were really such a, a tiny, tiny fraction of what was actually happening. And um, what did it for me, I think, in particular, was seeing that um, this was a way that my government was um, acting as an imperial power, that they were using our my tax dollars to spy on people all over the world um, and do them, you know, who knows what kind of harm. And so I thought that I had an obligation as an American to do something about this. Um, I also was very interested in some of the privacy enhancing technologies just on my own. Like, I don't know, you know, just sort of serendipitously I got interested in them. And so I thought that not only is this problem very massive, and I've seen that now, but that I know that there's some technology we can use to fight back against this, and that in libraries we have a really great opportunity because of the relationship we have to our communities to be the ones to introduce it. Libraries are already places where people go to learn any number of things. You know, we offer sometimes the only free computer classes that exist in our communities, whether it's for academic students, you know, in information literacy, whether it's in public libraries offering, you know, intro to the internet and things like that, we're already a space that people associate with that kind of education, and people trust us. So the next step, though, was that you know we know what it's like to have a really good idea in libraries and then have our patrons not care at all. You know, I know we've all had programs where we're like this is the thing, this is it, this is the one that I've been waiting for, and then no one comes. So I had to test it out in my in my community at first, of course, and I was floored by the response that I got. I the, the way that I began was I installed a couple of really basic tools on the library computers, um, a couple of browser extensions, and I made a couple signs and said, you might notice this on your browser, this is what it does, it's, it's blocking certain kind of advertising trackers. Give us some feedback if you like this. And then suddenly my inbox was, was flooded by people who really liked it. The next thing was that uh, as I was doing one-on-one -on -one technology help, whether formally or for, formally or informally, I would start to make suggestions, you know, unsolicited for things that people could do to help protect their privacy, even if that was just, hey, have you considered covering your camera? Here's why. And people were really excited about that. So then I started teaching a class, um, privacy protective technology class, and then immediately couldn't keep up with the demand for it. So it just sort of snowballed from there. Thank you. Thanks. Hello. Um, I was wondering if you could uh, make a comment about what uh, an institutional level might be able to do, and specifically think about uh, websites and encryption on the library websites. You're such an audience plant. <laughs> <laughs> encryption on library websites, that's a great question. So, tomorrow, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to I'm going to teach about this pr precisely this thing. Um, but I'll, I'll give you a little teaser. So encryption for websites uh, is, there is a, the way that you encrypt websites is by using um, something called TLS. Um, if you go to a website, you can tell if it's encrypted by the beginning of the web address. So if it says HTTP, it is not encrypted. If it says HTTPS, it is encrypted. And what that means is basically that the traffic between you and the server on the other end 
mylibrary.org would be the server on the other end. The traffic between you and that server um, is scrambled into a secret code that no one can read except for the intended recipient. So it's a kind of protection for the information that's traveling back and forth. On a library website, if you don't use encryption, what this means is when your patrons are searching for something on your website, uh, if they type in divorce or diabetes or abortion, let's say, uh, if they're using an unencrypted site, anyone who is observing that network traffic can see exactly what they're looking at. And how easy is it for someone to observe their network traffic? Well, there's a program that you can download on the internet for free called Wireshark that can analyze all packets that are traveling over a Wi-Fi network. And in order to be able to see that information, all they need is access to the Wi-Fi network. If you have a password on your Wi-Fi network, they just need the password, right? So this is why this is important. Now, what can be done about it? Um, HTTPS implementation is notoriously difficult. I'm a very technical person. It took me four hours to set this up on a website with nothing on it. However, there's a new project called Let's Encrypt, which is a free, open, and automated certificate authority, which is making it really easy for anybody who runs a web server to set up strong encryption by default and have it renew automatically forever um, until the sun burns out or the internet explodes or whatever that whatever comes first. And so if you want to learn more about Let's Encrypt, please come to my workshop tomorrow and I'll tell you all about it. <laughs> Any other questions? I think we have like a minute. We have one minute. One more question. You're live now on two people. Don't be shy. It's not stereotypes. Hi, uh, this is from DIT. I uh, have a question for you, Alison. Where do you draw the line between protecting individual privacy and uh, protecting the community from danger? Where do I draw the line between protecting individual privacy and protecting the community from danger? Great question. What, it depends on what you mean by protecting the community from danger. So I see a danger in uh, overbroad, pervasive government surveillance, and I would like to protect my community from that. Um, but I think that there is a tension with regard to uh, you know actual criminal activity happening and the, the, need that, the, the desire that people have, of course, for that not to happen in their communities. Um, the thing is, most criminal activity on the internet is happening in, in broad daylight. Uh, it is happening on without any kind of encryption. Um, it's happening um, by people doing things like spoofing their MAC addresses or um, using bots to, to um, perform actions on their behalf and do things like that. Um, the thing about criminals is that they have many options because they're willing to break the law. And I think that traditional law enforcement actually works better when you don't have mass surveillance. Um, there is a former FBI agent in the US who now works for the ACLU, and he fights against things like mass surveillance, and he talks about this. He says, you know, it's really, it's truly a needle in the haystack problem. If you have all the information, trying to find the thing, the important lead that you're looking for actually becomes much more difficult. So it doesn't even help law enforcement do their jobs, um, the other side of it is that thinking about that danger again, I'm interested in the dangers that the, that the sort of inherent hostility of the internet presents to people who are marginalized. So if you got rid of all encryption tomorrow, if you got rid of Tor browser, if you got rid of all these things that I'm recommending in the workshop tomorrow, um, the people who would suffer the most are those marginalized people. Um, domestic violence survivors, for example, are a group that's under a tremendous amount of danger of their location information being discovered. Quite often they're in tradition, or, sorry, transitional housing where the location of this housing is a secret. If somebody, if their abuser wants to find them, um, the way that the internet is currently set up makes it very easy to do that. Their IP address displays sometimes you know, geolocation information down to the, to the point of, of where they actually are. So those are the dangers that I'm most concerned with. The other thing is that I have yet to see any of these intelligence agencies prove that surveillance helps keep us safer. What I have seen is them lie over and over and over again about the relationship there. I mentioned already the Boston Marathon bombing as, a, as an example of how, you know, 
we had all this surveillance, it didn't work, and then they asked for increased surveillance. Another example is that the former director of the NSA, Keith Alexander, after the Snowden revelations came out, he was brought before Congress and asked to account for what had happened. And he said, you don't understand, we need all of this, it's a matter of national security, I can't tell you why, because that's how they, you know, it's national security, so it's a secret. Uh, but I, I can promise you that this actually has an effect on keeping us safer. And he was in front of Congress, so he had to tell the truth, and they said, okay, well, you need to tell us how many terrorist attacks your surveillance programs have stopped. Just give us a number. And he said, yeah, great, 56. 56 terrorist attacks. And then he was pressed to give evidence of these. And at first he tried to use the national security secret magic, you know, we can't tell you about it because then we have to kill you or whatever. Um, and they didn't, they didn't buy that and then he, they, they pressed him further. And eventually he said, well, okay, it wasn't 56, it was, it was 33. Okay, well, tell us about those 33. Well, actually it wasn't 33, it was 22. The number kept dropping until we got to one. And that one terrorist attack that, that was stopped by the massive surveillance programs um, was there was a man in Los Angeles who, sent, who made a wire transfer to um, his family in Somalia that allegedly had a connection to Al-Shabaab. Allegedly. That was it. So I would love it if they could show some more evidence of that, and I think then we could have a real conversation about whether there is some necessity of this. But so far, all I've seen are lies and no evidence. So, thanks for your question. Anybody else? I think maybe we're out of time. Yeah, perhaps. Okay, thank you guys.